It's How I Make Money with Andy Beetle. Welcome back to How I Make Money. Our guest this week is Jason Grill. He is the founder of J Grill Media. Uh, their consulting firm specializing in public affairs and communications and the dark art of public policy and media. I was joking with Jason before we started filming, you know, we're a marketing firm. I was like, you know, public relations is kind of that black magic world where the ability to spin and trend a story in the marketplace is so, at least to us, kind of mysterious. You know, we're just out buying impressions and, and telling us, telling a story. So super excited to talk with you today. Uh, his background is in law. He's also started the Grill Nation show which is a podcast was a radio show um and is are you still on 9 30 a.m in kansas city is that are you still doing radio there or? Uh, yeah so i'm on saturdays so i air on 9 okay. 80 a.m on um usually three o'clock central time uh, okay. but it, it fluctuates with like you know when the chiefs are in the super bowl or uh you know <laughs> we got basketball games they move me around but that's why it's great to have a podcast as well uh but i love doing i've loved working over there and doing radio so I it's just a fun yeah. little therapeutic session away from client services, Andy. I I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, <laughs> and 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 before the podcast, you know, we always ask guests, "Do you have a hard stop?" And Jason's like, "Yeah, I'm working all the time," which I think every business owner can appreciate. You you quit your job and then you go to work for somebody who's both a workaholic and a lunatic. So it's uh <laughs> it's always a tough road to hoe. But hey, tell tell people a little bit, Jason, about kind of the arc you took. I uh, not to um. Not to say it's odd, but it interests me to, you know, talk to somebody who had a law degree in that background and then moved into this agency world. Um, I know you had a political career and you've had that experience and went into PR. I would just love to hear more about how you got to where you were and some of the decisions you made along the way. I'm very entrepreneurial. I've found that to be the case over the years. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I have a background, of course, I, I worked in DC, I guess we'll start there when I was in college. And that's oh, okay. kind of where I kind of got the political bug. I, my dad's an attorney and started a small business, small practice. And so I always kind of had that fondness of politics, media, the law. And so I, I actually had an internship in DC, uh, in college at the White House. So oh, wow. that was a huge life changer for me uh, under the Clinton Gore administration, the final year. Oh, and so cool. I thought I was going to be working in D.C. When Clint, when Al Gore won the election, I thought, you know, I'll have a senior role as a or work with a senior level person and, and right. kind of grow from there and go to law school at night. Fortunately, that didn't happen. So I came back to Missouri and um, also worked at CNN at, at different points in D.C. and kind of as an intern as well. And so I kind of really like D.C. and like government and politics. And so um, anyways, I came back here. I got recruited to run for office while I was in law school. And uh, that's kind of why I took more of the political route, I guess you would say, than the typical law route. I've worked at law firms, but for me, it was more, um, you know, I've got my license still in both states, Missouri and Kansas, right. and I've practiced uh, when needed, but I've, I've been interested in other things. And so that was kind of the pathway to that. And uh, as far as the public relations uh, and, uh, you know, strategic comms and government relations right. type work, that kind of comes out of like when I left office, um, I had so many relationships in the media and in, uh, you know, communication sectors that I started to utilize them. I started to do my own television, my own radio, my own writing for national publications and locally here just to talk about elections or right. whatnot. And then out of that came um, people that wanted to hire me to help them to get exposure or connect them to government or connect them to the media. And so that's kind of how I started. I needed to make money, right? I didn't want to be a full-time lawyer. So <laughs> true. Um, that's kind of how that whole thing kind of happened in a nutshell in a very quick reader's digest version. Well, and you, you had, I mean, you had done, like you said, you'd work for CNN and I think you've written for like Politico and Forbes and, and yeah. you know, big properties like HuffPo, you know, when people go into business, I think it's um, you have a couple of things where I, you know, I mean, I've had people who just they kind of fell into what they do kind of by accident. And then you've got people who have a skill. I'm thinking, you know, oh, I'm I'm going to go start a restaurant or what have you. And then I think you've got people who have a, a an asset or a network and they go, well, wait a minute, that that network. And and to be frank, my reputation in it you know, that has value and carries weight and I can really serve people by connecting folks. Um, and, and I've got friends. Builder. 
Yeah. yeah. I've got friends whose entire business is built on connecting people. Um, and, and I think that's that's really huge. When, when you started doing this work, like talk a little bit, like what was your first paying consulting gig for somebody and what was that like and how did it get started? Well, and I got to say, when I started doing the blogging and whatnot for, um, uh, for like HuffPo and, and right. all those other groups, like that was like so new back then that like it had such a different vibe, you know? So when I wrote an article for them or, uh, it was like a national story and right. <laughs> it just, it just was like, a much bigger deal because there wasn't many people doing it at that point. There weren't many people mm-hmm. like kind of into that network that were allowed to. So I kind of really utilized that and, you know, write a story about entrepreneurship and it goes all across the United States quickly. And it's a big deal nowadays, you know, there's so many more people doing it. Right. Um, so maybe it's not as impressive, right? It's easier sure. access than it was back then. But, um, but your question was, Oh, my first client, uh, in my J Girl media at the time. And I've, I'm kind of now doing business as J Grow Consulting because I've done more. I'm doing more than media, but it's um, right. It was a uh, a very well known marketing guy who's written a bunch of books. John Jantz is a uh, duct tape marketing okay. is his company. Yeah, he, uh, he hired me. He had all this national um, level um, credibility. You know, he had done some of the national shows, but he just he's from Kansas City and nobody really knew him here. So he hired me to help him kind of go on the morning shows back then and get some uh, thought leadership pieces in our local papers and online. And so that was my first client. And I remember, I remember having to, you know, figure out how to do an invoice um, and show my hours. You know, I knew how to do it as a lawyer. You account for everything, man. You're accounting for every 15 minutes. But um, so, yeah, that was my first client. And I'm, and I, you know, I, it was crazy, you know, and then from there, it just kind of snowballed, you know, the more articles I written, the more, stuff I did, the more people, startups and entrepreneurs that wanted to hire me. And then I got a huge client with the Kauffman Foundation and worked with them for about six years as a consultant. And so that's a huge foundation. And so that was, that was when I was like, okay, I'm making money now, which is nice. Right. Right. (laughs) I hear you. Yeah. No kidding. Well, what's the, you know, tell me what, like, so you've got a real balance between, like you've got to kind of maintain your voice, if you will, out in the media so that people see you as a respected expert. Obviously, you've got to be sure not to <laughs> not to bring terrible guests onto somebody's show. Um, and then, you know, you're hunting up business. So what is what does that day look like? How do you break up your time and and how do you kind of Honestly, continue it's, moving it forward? It doesn't look the same ever. Um, and that's right. why I like it. Uh, it's very... Uh, like for instance, today I, I edited my podcast radio show, um, sent it to the guest. I uh, worked on some other client matters for another communications firm I work with. I had a board call for um, an association client that I do government relations for. I mean, it's mm-hmm. just it's just crazy, and I, I think that's why maybe I haven't been as financially successful. Maybe Andy as some of your other guests <laughs> is because I uh, I like working on projects I enjoy and. I've never really, I've tried to more so partner uh, with my LLC with different organizations than I have sure. tried to scale and hire a bunch of people. I just, I never really wanted to do that. I kind of like my freedom. And right. so, um, you know, I like being able to grind on a Sunday night or on a Saturday or on a whatever, but I also like, hey, if I want to leave early on a Friday and go play golf, um, I can have my phone attached to me, but I can make that happen. I'm not in a nine to five job which I enjoy. Well, and I, and I think that that's a challenge that a lot of entrepreneurs run into. You start a business and you maybe build up, you know, you, you build it up to a point that it can replace your current income. And you're like, oh, I'm going to go full time. And what you've really done is you don't, I mean, this is an old cliche, you know, you don't own a business, you own a job. And mm-hmm. the, the real game at the end of the day is is that freedom you talk about and it and it comes in a lot of different guises just before we got on i was talking to a client literally who called me 2 weeks ago he says hey uh, bro i'm going to be in costa rica for the next 8 weeks surfing um, so we'll do our meetings from down there. And he's in his late twenties. He and his partner started um, a, a really great real estate business. And and to be sure, it is a you know the the financial models that drive our work together are very sophisticated and involve a significant amount of money. But right, that's the goal for him. He's like, yeah, I'm I've got a surfing lesson this morning, and I'm gonna go uh, to this restaurant tonight, and we can talk at three thirty. And if not, I'll catch you tomorrow. 
I mean, to me, that's what it's all about, right? That kind of freedom to have the flexibility to do what you want to do. And it I, gives agree. You time. I agree yeah. with that, but I, I, maybe I overspoke. I, I don't know if I ever really have that freedom because of the business I'm in. Um, right. because it's all client based except for the radio right. show. And, um, so, I mean, it has its pluses and minuses, right? Sure. I mean, sure. you're always dealing with crises or, right. you know, needs, but at the same time, you have so much flexibility as far as the challenges and the clients and the day to day. It's just always a new adventure. It's not boring. You know what I mean? Yeah. So when when a client comes to you, what's the typical, um, or, or maybe not typical, but kind of what are the different types of problems people bring to you, and really how do they find out about you? Well, I'm just do a lot of do a lot of years of of relationship building, like you said, and just social media, LinkedIn, um, Twitter, Facebook. You know the you know the drill. Mm-hmm. Um, you know they 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 need policy engagement they don't know how to do advocacy they don't know how to connect to their local state or federal elected officials that's Mm -hmm. public relations is pretty self-explanatory they 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 want to get more stories or maybe they don't know they've been contacted by a member of the media and it maybe it's a crisis situation or they don't know what to do they don't know how to write a statement they don't know how to message they don't know how to put together their talking points they don't know how to deal with the media that's another thing Mm -hmm. um you know, a lot of times there's big development projects that have to go through not only speaking about their project to the media and to their constituencies, but also get through the city council process to and deal with mm-hmm. neighborhood meetings and those types of things. So, I mean, there's all different types of things. And with the radio show and the podcast, I'm really trying to connect with leaders, mm-hmm. CEOs, uh, thought leaders, newsmakers to learn from them. Um you know, life lessons and hear about their businesses. I call that my therapy every week because I get to sit (laughs) in the studio before COVID. I was going to a studio and doing it. And I had that hour and a half away from my email or phone, you know? Right. So, so it's, so it's a lot of different things. Um, and that's the beauty of it. Sometimes, you know, there's too many things, you know, I, I had someone reach out to me the other day for a, uh, an expert to testify in a trial on media bias. And I'm like, Okay, that's one thing. And then I had in that same day, I had wow. someone ask me about, you know, setting up a meeting or, uh, you know, or how do we even set up a meeting with a congressional member or with a mayor, you know, and it's just like, it's crazy, but it's fun. And then you have a crisis come in and then you're, you're dealing with statements or messaging. So it's, it's truly a consulting off of your experience. And that's the beauty of it. It's, it's, it's all enjoyable work. And I, and I think that stuff, applies to so many industries i've got a friend who just left uh being the uh the chef at a at a, at a very well regarded highly awarded restaurant to start a consulting thing so now he's doing consulting for subway and all these other restaurant chains and you know individual things and that all taps into his network of people and and you you find these strange connections and and over time if you if you cultivate them uh and and keep them fresh i think you you just really find your ability to deal with interesting problems just grows right i mean you get for one of a better word fun stuff um and it's you do and yeah. you learn a lot through that um and you learn a lot about yourself and kind of what you like to do and what you don't like to do yeah yeah i feel you well so what did what did 2020 do to your business because you've got this kind of twin uh it's the year of the plague we're all in isolation in our bubbles and it's the year where like everything's falling apart. It sounds to me like it would be a communication rich environment. Um, so yeah, what was what was your year like? You know, it did, it didn't change that much except for working from home. To be honest, I mean, there was so many more needs with, around um, communications and mm-hmm. advocacy and government relations and affairs because policy engagement was important because we you know, nobody knew like how do I interpret an eviction moratorium. I work with the Apartment Association of Kansas City, oh, wow. and they're they're having all kinds of you know new issues because of all these changes that have happened with COVID. Right. And um, you know, from that to you know, we had the protests in 2020 that were a big deal. Uh, yeah. We had an election. We had uh, you know COVID, and there's always messaging that's needed around that for associations or for companies or corporations or you know, frankly, like individuals sometimes. And so just 
I mean, it just was busier than ever as far as what I do. And it didn't change much because essentially you're having meetings, you're working right. on your laptop, you're using your phone. You just weren't going to an office setting. Uh, coffees were a lot less. Too many Zooms. I mean, right. kind of the nature of the same thing. I'm lucky to have a career where I can do everything um, remotely if needed. For real? But, you know, it, it has also yeah. affected me a little bit, too, to be honest, because I'm so used to having coffees or making sure every week that I meet meet my requirements to keep growing, right, and have purpose right. and learn. And when you're in front of a computer all day and you're not – Oh, doing yeah. things like that it does kind of affect you a little bit i th and i think everybody who who has gone into that work from home um we've got a, a client who's a executive coach up in chicago and she she and i were working on a piece for her this week and she was just talking about you know c c ceos c level whatever you know their teams are home and even just the management piece of that changed radically because I mean, the unit set of people in the world who want to be on five Zoom meetings in a day has got to be zero. And yet here we are. Right. And then, you know, yeah. the, the the cats are in and the kids are home and screaming. And, you know, then you're always wondering, is that person wearing pants? I mean, it's all, you know, it's this kind of it's such a bizarre change. And, and the, the interaction that comes with being with people face to face just is not the same. Um, and I can imagine, no, in not. you know, in your world just the ability to have lunch with somebody and have a casual conversation means so much. Um, it's hard to hang out on zoom. You know, yeah, it is. I tried the zoom happy hours early on with my friends yeah. and, and some of my colleagues. Um, it's definitely harder. Uh, it just, uh, it feels nice sometimes to do that again, uh, right. with, you know, social distancing and whatnot, but it is important. I will say it has made the radio show, a little bit easier time wise um, sure. because I'm able to not have to go into the studio and I can do it from home. That was one thing that right. kind of came out of COVID I think, but, um, but you know, with everything you live and learn and it, it's, there's subtractions, there is additions, but right. I feel as if, you know, 2020 we've, we've made it through that. I don't feel like 2021 has been any slower as far as client needs and, people that want to be on the radio show and, and the podcast and, you know, I'm trying to do it like via video now, via, mm -hmm. via uh, radio and via podcast to try to get people more ways to watch. I mean, it's just, it never stops. You know, there's, right. you accomplish certain things in a day and you go to bed and you're like, okay. And you get up <laughs> and you, you start over and, you time, know, if you can get a reset, run in, that's yeah. a positive. If you can do right. anything like, so, you know, I, I've gotten used to it. At some point, I don't know if I ever will retire, Andy. I just think that there will always be other things um, that I can help people with. I enjoy oh, I it. You. I love I, I love the you. energy that people give me, and that's why I like being in the people business. Well, and it's and it's always, you know, I so for I was a university professor before I started my first company, and um, the first company we worked in concentrated almost exclusively in uh, marketing for higher education. So we had, you know, colleges and universities, for-profit, non-profit, community colleges, whatever, across the country. And I would get asked, you know, I'd get interviewed by somebody, Wall Street Journal or, you know, magazine, Vanity Fair, or not Vanity Fair, Atlantic, stuff like that. And and I got to tell you, after like two of those, I mean, I used to speak to people professionally. I stood up in front of a class every day, four hours a day, and I cannot give an interview to save my life, it turned out. And not sound like a confused hobo. So it's something that I found fascinating and why I kind of referred to the public affairs, public relations stuff as a dark art. When you work with clients, what do you tell them about, A, getting exposure in the media, and B, how to talk to the media? And obviously there are two things, right? Somebody's writing a hard-hitting story. And, and you know you want to speak carefully and then I think there's the other thing where you want to be a resource to people in the media if they need an expert um, how do you get people started on that path and what types of kind of rules of thumb do you give them um, for how to talk to them I I think you know they're just like us they, they have a job to do and um, I always try to keep it simple like keep stick to three key message points if you're doing an interview which obviously this is different because it's an all, a long podcast right. and I've, yep. I've bounced around a lot, but if, 
if I was coming on your show to promote something, I'd try to stick to three or three to five things. Three probably mm-hmm. is max. Gotcha. And I'd re- reiterate that over and over and over again until even if, you know, like, so if I was on, a, uh, if I was a politician, let's just hypothetically say on a morning show and the reporter was asking me all these questions and they were things I didn't want to answer. I'd just stick to my three key message points. It's annoying to the viewer, but it's the best advice there is because then you, you're able not to, you're able to react to the gotcha questions and whatnot. If I am a a person trying to get more positive media and, you know, uh, I would, I would just try to connect with people in different forms, whether that's, you know, uh, print, whether that's, you know, TV reporter just saying, Hey, if you ever need anything on, let's for instance, say I'm an entrepreneur and I can speak to you about entrepreneurship policy. So if there's ever a bill count on me to come on the air and talk to you about why entrepreneurs need this, uh, so I, I just think it goes back to relationships. Um, but as far as the media training, I think key message points, uh, bullets, short bullets, white space, right. the form of the old press release doesn't work anymore. You have to have a personal pitch. Everything's about personalization. Whether you're reaching out to someone in the media, whether you're reaching out to a legislator or a congressional member, you have to tell your story. If you don't tell your okay. story at the beginning in a very understandable, brief <clears throat> way, they're not going to look at it. They get hundreds of emails a day. Right. And so right. Um, that's why the relationships are huge. And that is why um, storytelling and, and, and how you kind of put it on the email is important. Yeah. And how, how do you work with people on telling their story? And we wrestle with this all the time. Um, you know, clients will come in with a project in a business and they want to grow in a particular vertical or a different way. And and the the work of eliciting the the truly emotional, interesting pieces of their story is often, I mean, it's a tough process. And then to mm-hmm. boil it down into something that in our world, it's we help X do Y through Z, or we help X avoid Y through Z. Um, and, you know, that's the kind of formula, but it takes weeks to get there sometime. Uh, how do you start that process with a client who comes to you and says, I need help? Well, it just depends. If they need help on um, on media, then right. you know we kind of go through a process where you ask them the right questions. You ask them kind of what what your goals are. You know what what news do you have to come out? What landmark news do you have to come out? Um, mm. And that type of thing. If it's somebody on the advocacy front, it's what what's important to you with policy. Who do you know that's already an elected official? How how um, how should you message this? What do you do when you meet with them? What's the best way to meet with them? Um, how do you get other people to join you in coalitions and those types of things and go through all these questions? I mean, you kind of get the the feel of what they want pretty quickly. If it's, mm-hmm. if it's, if it's a crisis situation, um, in your mind, you're thinking about all the traps that the normal person wouldn't think about whether or not they should even respond, how they should respond. Is this something that they should get involved with? Should they not get involved with? I mean, it, internally, I think about those things. It's like breathing almost. Um, right. you've done it so many times or been in the arena so many times, you're able to kind of internalize it. I would say if you were a, a lawyer and you were doing drafting a will for someone, you, uh, you kind of understand by like the hundredth will you've done kind of the 20 <laughs> questions in your mind that you need to figure out. And that's kind of right. how you do it with, any, with media relations or with, sure. um, advocacy and, and policy engagement and public affairs. I mean, they all kind of are, uh, the same way, um, it's just a natural instinct, I guess, after years and years of doing it. Um, so, and I, and it really helps too, that I do kind of the media stuff too, on the side and been on television right. sets and, and also that I've been a elected official and cause you kind of know what these people are thinking about. Mm-hmm. You kind of mm-hmm. know, like if, if you're a former reporter or a member of the media, you kind of know what the reporter or member of the media is going to ask or what they're trying to get out of a story. And when people say certain things and read certain things, I don't know if they quite understand, like, you know, kind of the process and and what goes into these types of things. So I don't know. It's instinct at this point. I'm 41 now, so I've been doing a bunch of a lot of stuff for a while here, Andy. So (laughs) (laughs) I haven't even talked about my entrepreneurial venture that I did. Um, That was not related to anything. It was uh, a product company I started with three other guys in 2012 around socks before anyone was making colorful socks or branded socks. Um, we started doing it and now the company has grown immensely, uh, in the promotional product space. I exited in 2018, but I was the original 
guy that created a sock of the month club and a uh, colorful socks when everyone was wearing gold toes. So it is <laughs> hilarious so that, that you me mentioned. learn a lot about entrepreneurship too. I hear you. And I love that. My, our managing director. So every year you come into the holidays and you go, okay, we, you know, we've got to get stuff for our clients and you know, what gifts are we going to send? And she was looking at some, you know, ideas for that. People were bouncing them off her and went on this sock kick. Yeah. And we got socks for everybody. And, and you, you think about it for a minute and, and that is one of the things I absolutely love about entrepreneurship. You know, in the in the trucking industry, we go, hey, everything you have in your house came there thanks to a truck. Um, and when you look at everything around you, you go, you know, somebody built a business off of making these and making the <laughs> stickers. And, you I know, got and, my and, coffee thing here, and it's like, I mean, yeah. come on, man. How would we not think of these ideas? Exactly. We, we wouldn't have to and, do client work anymore. Right. And, and there's an endless ability to see opportunity around you. And and I love that. You know, you look at socks and you go, okay, especially in the old school uh, business wardrobe world, right? Yep. Where you had your kind of your blue suit and your white shirt and you go, okay, I got three things I can wear that can set me apart without getting in trouble. My socks, my tie, and my pocket square if I'm in the right, you know, if I'm in the right office. And and then you riff on that. And I think the whole sock game is fascinating. My daughter actually got me a socks sock of the month subscription uh, for Christmas this year. And, you know, every month I wow. get my socks like like I think last month it was, uh, you know, uh, New England crabs, you know, like bought like Massachusetts crab, you know, crab pot crabs. Um, so hilarious that you would say that. So why, why did you bail out of that in 2018? Was this getting to be too much time or? Uh, we, you know, we had. Um... You know, we're, we were on a project runway spinoff that was kind of like uh, Shark Tank. And then, you know, we had oh, cool. grown to, I think, two or two million in revenue or, you know, we needed to get up to five. And, and there right. was, you know, at that point, it's like, we don't want to dilute ourselves. We're going to have to get a loan. And, and it's like, mm. I just kind of was like, you know what? And we kind of had that moment of, of with, you know, the different organ people that started the company. And one guy right. was going to go all in. And the other one kind of wanted money out of it. You know, so you had that dynamic at play sure. and so that's kind of what happened and the guy that stuck with it it seems to be doing very well they're doing shoes now and for major corporations socks all kinds of stuff so i i'm, I'm happy for them and uh but through that i i do kind of miss that to be honest i do miss that that idea that 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 was kind of a fun six or seven well i guess it was probably five or six years but right um there was always like that like, so, you know, different sports teams do well. And, and then you sell certain colors of that. And then that drive, that e-commerce drive, but also like seeing like your socks everywhere in town and in different companies that are major corporations doing it for their employees. It was just a cool vibe. And um, right. I kind of really missed that. Like, okay, so here's this one thing that could potentially grow to a certain amount and then I can retire off that. And, you know, that <laughs> I don't have that now. It's all my time right. now. Everything is time-based. So. I still kind of miss that day, most days, and kind of look forward to hopefully engaging with more entrepreneurs and investors and trying to figure out kind of what can, what can we do? Like, what's the next big thing? And I uh, I do think about that a lot because I enjoy kind of that entrepreneurial, you know, betting on yourself and, you know, what, what you can accomplish. And so that was a fun journey. Um, yeah. But it turned out well. There's been I other things it. I've invested in that died, you know, that were, that didn't turn out well. So... Well, and that and that's the name of the game, and I think people don't really um, there. There's a lot to be said for you find product market fit, and you find a process that works, and and as we say, it can scale, meaning it can get bigger easily. You know, doing the same thing over and over. That reoccurring um, revenue became a yeah. theme. I, I heard that yeah. so many times. You got to remember, oh, yeah. Andy, when we did this, it wasn't like Shopify wasn't like a real big thing yet. There was right? no. You right. know, nobody was wearing socks with patterns on them. Nobody was, um, this e-commerce thing just was starting, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. and what it is today, it was like getting a website Miniscule. built. Yeah. It was like, yeah. how do we take a credit card back then? Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I think that's part of the game in entrepreneurship. You, you, you try a bunch of stuff and you iterate quickly and what works you keep doing and what doesn't work you cut 
you know, and, and, and there's what doesn't work for you, right? You know, you've got uh, three partners in a business and one wants to go this way, one wants to go and the other one wants to go all in, as you say, you know, okay, great. That's a, that's an inflection point where people make decisions and maybe some people leave the project and other people come on and there's nothing the matter with that. And I think that's such an important part of, at least when you have the kind of personality that obviously you and I share, where you've just got this kind of insatiable curiosity for things and to be frank how to monetize them you know it it's you you just are constantly you've got your kind of radar out we find this all the time people come to us you know i love among the many things i love about the work we do with clients i love the opportunity to kind of especially smaller clients if if, to be a little dramatic about it to be inside somebody's dream right and to go, you know, they're like, they've got big things going on. They're excited. And you're like, great, I get to be part of this team. So we kind of get the best of all of it, right? Where you move from great project to great project. Um, you know, we may not own the sock company, but we do own the ability to grow the sock company, if that makes any sense. So it's that's it's why that's what I love about it. And that's why I like doing like stuff like this. Um, right. I learn a lot. I connect a lot. And frankly, that's why I've kept my show going. It's like just having people that you connect with for an hour and learn from and then it always creates new opportunities oh and yeah you never, where, you never know where those can go and it gives me energy you know i've always right. been kind of more of an ambitious like type a let's work hard you know you gotta you gotta work hard to be successful um more so maybe than the what is it the work smarter not harder i'm kind of the work harder <laughs> guy that if you work hard good things happen and if you build relationships right. and help people good things happen and so um so yeah, I, it's just exciting. It's an opportunity. I'm excited about, you know, who I'll meet next and where what we'll accomplish together and what we can change and make the world a better place. I mean, it, 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 and offer something that is good for people. I mean, I, I love doing yeah. that kind of stuff. I hear it's not you. All I cri- it. I, I, you know, the crisis stuff is, uh, that stuff's a little harder, crisis comms, but the other stuff is, uh, is always a right. positive, I think. I hear you. Yeah, crisis comms is the... Uh, what was it? Uh, talking to a lawyer friend of mine during the 2008 downturn, and I said, "So how's business?" He says, "Well, you know, people are still getting in trouble. They just can't pay for it anymore." You know, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you kind of, oh yeah, that's a drag. You know, I like it. I love it. Well, hey, what you know, you, we've got a, almost two months of 2021 under us. What are you excited about for your projects and business coming up this year? um gosh i'm very excited about kind of doing the show now with video that's kind of cool on my mm-hmm. radio show and, and podcasts as far as clients go i'm working with a uh, organization called right to start which is a um, okay. kind of it's a it's an entrepreneurial advocacy organization that just started former head of coffin foundation of entrepreneurship has started this to build a kind of a national campaign to kind of support policies that directly help new and small businesses and entrepreneurs and I don't think anything like this has ever been created as far as, you know, we have we have we have associations for everything. We have the NRA, we have the ACLU, we have the uh, the National Apartment Association, but we've never really had one for people, entrepreneurs and, and to really kind of reinforce that everyone has the right to start a business and how to do it. And, mm-hmm. and so that's kind of exciting to me. And that that actually is just kind of started. I've kind of helped them with policy engagement and at and, and consulting and um so for that I'm really excited about because I think that could grow to a national scale and we could help, you know, people in all different local states and federal level type operations. So that's been really cool. I'm excited about that as well. Um, and just very excited from where I stand about springtime, man. <laughs> um, I love being and, and obviously COVID, COVID coming to a close and we can, uh, right. you know, we just came off a Super Bowl here in Kansas City. So. You know, that was fun. Uh, not the not the outcome, but like the run up. And um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm just excited to keep growing, man. I'm excited to keep meeting new people around this journey and, um, you know, hopefully make a little bit more money than I made uh, last year, if that's possible. You never know. There it's tax time right now. So it's always one of those things where that one of the other negatives of, uh, of being a your, uh, solo business owner and entrepreneur and consultant is and having, you know, different businesses is trying to figure out. Um, and get your taxes together. And I just did that. So, um, you know what your income was, you know, what your expenses were, you know, uh, what you didn't and didn't do the year before. And so that's kind of a good point to like jump off of, of how can I grow and how can I utilize my time as well as possible? 
Oh, and and I am always and and to kind of tie together the entrepreneurship project you're working on and that point, you know, our our kind of look at the market late last year, the number of new businesses being started as a direct result of the pandemic and people, you know, kind of being forced into new circumstances is staggeringly large. And you think about that and we get calls, you know, with a fairly high degree of frequency from people who honestly can't afford us. And yet you hate to turn them down. So what do you do? You know, so we we started doing all this work on how to, you know, teach people through a course how to take, a, you know, how to start a side hustle. Then how do you take that side hustle, make it a business that you can eat on and that kind of stuff. And and I think the idea of having there be a national advocacy and policy group for, yep. you know, truly these types of small businesses that are starting because the barriers to entry to starting a business now and the availability of capital in the United States is unprecedented. Um Low barrier to and entry, gonna, high, and those are those are yeah. zero barriers to entry. Those types of yep. things, you know, different regulations. New money is going to yep. be coming from the feds into different states, and how do they invest in venture capital and do that and make it last for one fund to another fund to keep growing yep. on each other? I mean, there's so many things on Right to Start. It's the name of the organization, so that is exciting. But and I think it's exciting for me, Andy, to be honest, is because usually in politics or in government or in engagement in policy, it's always like, you know very heated and controversial to me these types of issues are pretty bipartisan you know right. young and small companies create more jobs in our country than any of the big companies do and mm -hmm. so i don't know it's just a rallying cry I, I it excites me to talk about helping new and young businesses grow like you just said with your company it's like yeah sometimes you can't work with them because of the costs right. involved but you can help them in different ways and, and that's oh, what yeah. I, i'm excited about it, it's you know funny to go back to politics. So where I went to school long ago and far away, um, Paul Wellstone um, was one of my professors, and I was fortunate enough to graduate from college when he ran his success, successful campaign against Rudy Boschwitz in Minnesota, and unseated him for the Senate seat. And and you know what a down to earth guy. I don't know if you had the opportunity to meet him um, when you were working on the Hill, but when we would go back to school, a couple of my friends were worked on his campaign and he said something fascinating. He said, you know, if I get, you know, email, this is back when email was a new thing. He said, I get letters all the time, but if I get a couple emails on a thing, I get concerned, you know, from regular citizens. If I get six phone calls about something, you know, that's a four alarm fire for me. And a buddy of mine said, yeah, and Paul, you know, I think you're the only guy who uses that as your primary focus group research to decide the best way to change. And again, for him, it was always bottom up. It was, what do people need? we got a lot of needs. Where is the point of greatest leverage that I can do good? And I think this idea of right to start is just gorgeous because... I mean, that's part of the American dream, right? To achieve some financial freedom. You know, we aren't all going to be millionaires and billionaires, but, you know, we've got the ability to enjoy our lives, maybe to have some ownership in a home and the idea to start a business. I mean, that's what this has all been kind of founded on, right? So I love that. Um, I love you know, what putting, you just said about advocacy, you know, too. Yeah. Because nowadays, I was just on a training seminar and I'm doing training seminars now on how to, how to you know, do all this with whatever level of government. And uh, there was a statistic that it takes at least 100 emails, I think, or 150 emails on a bill or an action item for, for a legislative assistant to get it to the next person, to get it to the next person. So it is like makes an impact, right? Yeah. And that is fascinating because, and again, that's why the personal story is important. Right. You know, how is this going to impact your community? How is this going to impact your business? Um why is this important to you? I mean, you got to cut through a lot of this with technology, you know, advocacy has really changed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, I've certainly emailed our representatives and senators about issues or sent them a letter and you get these, uh, here's this form letter, form letter, here's their number, here's whatever. And I think to myself, well, I mean, all, all that's going to do is tell a, a, an, an aide or somebody in that office oh for crying out loud not another one but when you take the time to say hey here here are the issues as far as i see them 
I've been in business in this community for 20 years. You know, I understand the job you've got. It's not easy. Here's my perspective. I, I would like to see a vote go this way. Here's why I think this is a good idea. Um, I think it carries a lot more weight because that personal connection matters. And it's getting rarer and rarer, I think, in some cases. Very much so. I appreciate you sending those letters, though. I like that. Yeah. I like well, your I, advocacy. <clears throat> yeah. And I think I've got a good friend who is in um, – he, he heads up our local historical theater and – when he came on board, you know, we, we used to have lunch together a couple times a month and he looked at the theater's revenue and looked at what they did. And he said, yeah, you know, we need to be able to serve alcohol. Mm -hmm. Like we need that. And Virginia did not have that legislation and he en embarked on a campaign to make that happen. And, and the brilliance of it, um, shout out to Ian Fortier here in Roanoke and the Grandin Theater, you know, the brilliance of that campaign was he made it very personal and he made it about the value to the community and small business and then rallied the donors behind him so that, you know, I wrote letters and this, that, and my letter was different than his. And I think it's easy to believe as the result of what you may see in the news and maybe the spin on that, that individual voices don't matter to people anymore. It's like, you know, yeah, there's political donations and this, that, and the other, but I mean, these people have a job to do. They need stories to tell, and they need that emotional resonance and to understand the impact for their constituents. And, and to my mind, writing that letter is doing somebody a favor in a way, right? It's not only doing them a favor, and but it's also a lot of times they file things locally. We're talking mm -hmm. about local here that they don't really know everything about. And then once they right. file it, they start to hear from all these voices, which make the bill better. I mean, right. that's truthfully what happens. I mean, as a former legislator, I can say that because you can't be educated on all these different issues as somebody that's, you know, when I got elected, I was very young and, uh, you know, it just, you don't know about all this stuff. I mean, right. I don't know about farming issues, right? I mean, I right. grew up in the city. I grew up in the <laughs> suburbs of the city. I'm in the city now, but like, I, I'm going to rely on the person who has the experience who does this to talk to me about it. Uh, right. So no, it's fascinating to me. And I think you're right. I think we, we've kind of hit that inflection point where maybe people think either my, my I don't matter or there's just too much, too many, too many communications. Like it's, right. it's one or the other because there's so many things out there. I mean, just like when you do this show every week and I do mine, it's like, oh, my God, I got to post to this. I got to post to this. I got to cut this. I got to. Right. I mean, it's just like it's just too much, man. And then there's a new app or. A TikTok comes around. You're like, I'm not on that yet. Do I need to get on that? You know, it's a there lot of stuff. There you go. Well, I, I will say my uh, my strategy for dealing all with that is to always hire young people who understand it. So that is the uh, I'm gonna have you to know, connect with you after the show to learn about some of these people. There you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's been and that's been a real blessing because um, it is it's hard it's hard to keep up with all of it and and to kind of you know maintain that ability to do it as a as a one person shop. You know, um, yeah, fascinating. So what's the um, if you're looking, if you if you were to kind of look forward into the coming year, and I know you can never know, especially given the last year we've had, what what do you think the kind of big policy issues, especially in the business landscape, are going to look like now that you've started up with this new organization? Well, I think you know the funding and how the states utilize right. all this money that's coming in through the the America Rescue Plan and the next one that's mm -hmm. the recovery. I don't I don't know the proper names, but there's two bills that'll come out of Congress in the next couple months that are right. huge like whether they're for uh, covid relief or infrastructure or um you know helping companies grow. I mean all of those mm -hmm. things have to be handled correctly by all these different states. So I think I think, you know, when the federal government sends all this money to these states, I guess the question is, is do they do the same bureaucratic things that they've done for years or do they right. maybe innovate a little bit and try to learn from maybe some of the things that didn't work in the past? I mm -hmm. think that's important yeah. um, because, you know, politics becomes an issue then, too, with funding and budgets. And, you know, um, I don't know. I think that's a big deal. We have probably haven't yeah. seen this much money coming into the the states for you know for the stimulus act, I guess. Um, right. You know, if we're looking out further, the COVID relief bills have been huge, but I think the next one's going to be really big. The next right. one or two. So, and then I think too, infrastructure could be a big deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, we might see a lot of funding for infrastructure now with the makeup of Congress and the president. So, I think that'll be fascinating to see how what people do with that money. 
I mean, what, sure. what are we going to rebuild? Are we, are we rebuilding our bridges and highways? Are we starting to think about different types of transportation? Mm-hmm. You know, in Missouri, you know, we were one of the finalists for the Hyperloop. And I think that's still oh, being wow. considered okay. from Missouri to, or Kansas City to St. Louis. You can get on it. Right. It's a four hour drive. You can do it in about 20 minutes on a Hyperloop. So yeah. it just changes the whole economics of a state. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's another thing to look for. And then again, like how the media interprets it all and, and, you know, uh, how to normal new, new businesses get engaged. Cause there's going to be a lot right. of new government procurement contracts out there. And how does a new business or a small business have a chance, right? A minority owned sure. business. How do these people have a chance to, to attain this work, to grow their companies? That's going to be huge too. Well, and there's a, and there's a, uh, flip side to that too. I would mentioned my wife being in finance and she's got a lot of clients who own small businesses. When the first, just for example, the PPP loan stuff came out, you know, I've been doing what I do for two decades. I mean, my application was in within hours of our bank's portal being opened. And, 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 you know, I've been, I've been banking for business through four businesses. I always have a local bank as part of that. And I knew that the local bank would be easier because we're not a 40 million, $50 million company, you know, that Chase is going to have us on the low end of their loaning spectrum. And, and she, for weeks afterwards was answering what were to me very elementary questions. But if you're not part of that system and constantly thinking about it, you don't know. You know, you you own a shoe store, or you've got a restaurant, or or whatever. Um, and and giving people access through education, I think, is going to be very important as this new stimulus comes down the pipe, so that people can take advantage of it and and have access to those things. Um, Completely agree, and yeah. I think you made a great point for local banks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, well, they became very useful. Your relationships came very useful the last year. Yeah, and it's uh, and I don't and I don't know that people understand this you know, what, what would you would consider a community bank? So assets at like a billion or less, you know, those are the people who are funding your startup in town, right? You know, they're the ones who are loaning you that money. You're not going to get that loan from Citibank capital or whoever, you know, you're going to get that loan from your local bank. And I don't know what it was 20 years ago, there were 25,000 of them. Now there are fewer than 5,000. And and having that ability, I don't think people really understood how important it was until they started getting turned down. Mm -hmm. And they went, well, wait a minute. I've been a good customer for years and years and years. And Chase goes, yeah, I don't care. You only make a million to a year. You know, you're you're not even really on our radar is more than a credit card fee. So that that relationship is, uh, I think, really key. And and the work you guys are going to do, you've got advocacy on the one end. And I think advocacy always has to go with education. Where it's, and also in education and branding, like so, right. you got to get your story out there. You got to do op eds. Right. You got to do letters to the editor. You got to do call to actions if it's a political or a policy matter. But then, like as far as telling the story of the of the entrepreneur, or the business, or the you know, what are the three or five things we can do as a country? You gotta you gotta ask it and do those things. I always tell people, you know, the media landscape has changed. They're not just going to put on your press release on a, on a website or put it in the newspaper. <laughs> Like, you have to right. offer value to these people, whether it's right. as a source or whether it's as someone that can can use the, all of their life lessons and mm-hmm. maybe draft an op-ed about an issue or about their why they're doing what they're doing, why they're why they innovate, why they are, are an entrepreneur. I mean, there's so many different things, and you can't you can't forget about the media component. I think I right. think any, even with policy, you need that media component because that really kind of drives it. The legislators hear about it, um, you know. The media is always looking for stories. Right. Every single yeah. day that a reporter walks into a TV station, they have to do something. You know, they have to, they have to <laughs> produce a story, right? And so yeah. I think people need to remember that um, because mm-hmm. you never know when they might do a story about your business or a charity you work with or, you know. But every yeah. day they have to do something. So they're always looking for content. Yeah. And and having content that's got a very, I guess, you know, for want of a better term, a very ho- a very simple hook that says, you know, here's the issue, here's the solution, here's the emotional payout um, can be really helpful. And, and I think people dismiss the value of small business in a community. I mean, we talk about it as if it's a great thing, but I don't think people really understand that, you know, maybe Amazon will come to your town and have a distribution center 
and certainly there will be jobs associated with that, and that's a net positive. But you know, the amount of tax base that they're going to offer is really their employees spending money in the community. Um, the small businesses around those employees are the ones who are paying, you know, business license taxes, property taxes, all these things that, you know, they're not getting a tax break. And they're fine with that, right? Because it's, you know, sort of what we do. And, and the value of those businesses in any community, especially ones who've traditionally not had a lot of access, you know, or resources behind that, I think are huge. So uh, kudos to you for getting involved in that project. That's going to be really fun to watch. It will be. I'm excited yeah. about it. And that's what a consultant does, right? We got right. three or four clients we can handle the time. We got six or seven accounts here we can work on and provide senior advising. Yeah. Um, you know, and then we have a radio show and podcast, which is uh, <laughs> we get to talk to people like you. And we got to get you on my show too. I got to get you around some of my sponsored shows. Um, but I'd love to have you on as well to talk about your career and, and kind of some. I'd like to learn. And so the more I can learn, the better. So we got to do well, that's that. That's good. What we'll do is um, I'll come on and our original thought when we started this podcast was to call it what not to do. And then I would be the only guest for like the first year and could just talk about every stupid mistake I've made in 20 years in business. I figured I figured the first year would get me through my first two or three months of business. Um, and then, you know, if there was an appetite for everybody else to come on and talk about how dumb they were, you know, <laughs> we could do that. So I, I can, I can have the, I can be the mistakes were made episode on the uh, grill nation. Podcast. I'd love to hear it. I'd love to hear it. I'd love to hear it. We learn oh. from those, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's, it's a thing, you know, if, if we're, you know, lucky enough to grow and have new team members come on board at some point, there's always that conversation that says, Hey, you know, we are all going to make mistakes. You know, you could start making them today and make one every day. You are never going to catch up to me. The goal is just to try not to make the same one twice, right? That's what, that's what you really <laughs> want to do, you know, learn and move on. Don't make it twice. So yeah, no, that would be a lot of fun. I'd love it. And I think, um, I think it's something that it's, you know, it's easy to get excited about hearing stories from inspirational figures. You know, I'm a big David Goggins fan, um, and I love, you know, listening to like Jocko Willink's podcast or, you know, hearing about how Sarah Blakely built Spanx. I mention that all the time, um, and, and that's great. But I really enjoy hearing the stories of, you know, what I call, what we call, you know, ordinary people who, who've built extraordinary businesses, right? Because to go out on your own, and do all of this is a real achievement that deserves to be celebrated. And I don't care if you own a hot dog cart or a, you know, $100 million window company, you know, getting to that point that you are feeding yourself every day is a huge milestone. And those stories are worth learning from. So it's an exciting, those they are exciting conversations are. for they you. They definitely are. Yeah. And they, you know, I don't know about you, but a lot of times in your life, did your friends that they're like, what are you doing now? Like, what 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 do you do on a daily basis? I mean, I've gotten that question so many times. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, because yeah. you're not working for a big company. You're not you're right. not doing the nine to five at a a big uh, Fortune 500 company. You know, it's right. just different. It's a different, yeah. oh, totally yeah. different life. Yeah, yeah. I when I when my kids were in high school, uh, people would ask, "What does your dad do?" And their answer was, "Well, I don't really know." You know, I mean, yeah. he's in, he does marketing stuff. I know that, you know, they do that. Well, that billboard, that was them. Uh, so yeah, I hear you. Well, Hey, I, I res want to respect your time and we, uh, I could talk to you all day long, Andy. There you go, man. <laughs> well, we do. Well, this may, this may spark the next hour. We have two questions. We ask everybody who comes on board, everything up till now has just been light stretching and a warm up because now the heavy lifting gets done. Question number one if you were talking to somebody who was going to start a business, you know, entrepreneur thinking of going in business for themselves, no matter the vertical or the type of business, and you could give them one and only one piece of advice, what would that piece of advice be? Uh, I would say there's always that mentality, and I don't know these questions in advance, so this is good. There's always <laughs> that mentality to keep everything you're trying to do hidden from others, and mm, I think okay. that... I think you should share your idea or you should share kind of what you're going to do with your, you know, friends or whatever or colleagues that your mentors to see what kind of feedback they give you. Cause I think that actually makes you, your company better. Interesting. Did I lose you there? No, I love so, that. So, so essentially, yeah. so essentially, so, you know, talk it out a little bit, right? What your idea is or what you're going to do as an entrepreneur. Cause I think 
that helps you before you launch, right? Right. You shouldn't be worried about someone stealing an idea or a, being jealous or whatever. Oh, I think, yeah, yeah. I think it makes it a little bit better of a company when you launch if you get that feedback. Well, and and I love that idea because we talk about this with clients all the time. You know, the holy grail is is what we call product market fit, right? There are a lot of, I mean, the number of products and services that I've been convinced the market needs and that the market has no interest in is truly heartbreaking and, and leaves most of my genius unsung, sadly. But the um, the reality is once you find that thing the market wants, no matter how bizarre it is, right? I mean, pet rocks or whatever, you know, getting to product market fit requires, you're exactly right, a lot of conversations, right? Yeah conversations in, in you know surveys or whatever so i love that idea of talking to people before you get going um or as you're starting up and bouncing ideas off them and the wider that audience in a lot of ways the better the feedback right right and I, i'm not saying like you need to have a business plan and you, everything yeah. has to be perfect you know like right. i'm like totally against that like everything being perfect before you get started but you know talk to a few people right right see what they think yeah um That'd be my first advice. And also to help people, you know, you're not going to get paid a bunch of money up front. You got to, you got to do a lot of hard work and you got to, right. you really just need to like be there for people. And I think if you do that, then they were, they return the favor when maybe when they have a friend who needs help or whatever. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned talking to mentors before you start, and that's something that we haven't had the opportunity to talk a lot about on the podcast is, is really the importance of having mentors in your life it, it, it may be a lot of different feel, you know, or whatever. I mean, you could have your, you know, oh, fitness and business and whatever. Um, and, and I like the idea of the assumption, you know, that says, hey, when you're starting out, it's it's worth having those people, right? Yeah. Who who have a, an interest in your success. Obviously, they're not going to do it for you, but that who can act as a sounding board because, you know, they can kind of, I mean, not like you have to follow everything they do, but you know, they can kind of say, oh, I'm going to do socks. And maybe they're like, ah, who cares? Socks are dumb. But where are you going to manufacture them? Right. That gets yeah. to be an interesting question. So we can skip past the you don't like my idea to, oh, well, that's an interesting question. You know, from a marketing standpoint, anything you can do that's made in the USA and that's maybe got something special about it, like it's organic and made entirely from rutabaga shoots or something weird like that, like I can charge more. Right. My unit volume is more and my market for that gets more interesting. And, and there are all these things. And, and having mentors who have been through a lot of stuff, at least to me, the earlier you talk to them, the more quickly you can identify these ideas and issues that you want to pursue as you get started. So I love that as as a piece of concrete advice, because it's it's something that I think people just don't think about. It's like, yeah, tell everybody, you know, and start having conversations because that's all it is in the end. Right. I got a quick story. Um, Go. Around yeah, that. I love it. I, I don't know anything around socks, right? I mean, come on, like who knows how, what, <laughs> how hard it is to make a sock until they try. But one of the other founders, there was actually a sock college he went to in uh, North Carolina when we started our business. And I think we had a couple of prototypes that we had gotten from India, China, the US. And uh, I think there were people in there from like Target and, uh, you know, bigger companies. Right. And he put our socks out on the table and the, the bigger companies were like, oh my God, like, what are you doing? And he was basically like, look, I'm showing you what we've done. Like they were so protective of their proprietary socks or whatever. But anyway, so I found out there's an actual like week or a, a something called the Sock College in North Carolina where there's a lot of socks made. So the there Sock you go. College and the sock industry gets together to <laughs> textiles, to, man. They love them out there. Yeah. Oh, for real. That's interesting. Well, and there's there's so much to be learned right from peers in the business. And you said this earlier, excuse me, I think people believe that you know, that, for example, you know, the success of Jeff Bezos was figuring out that people wanted to get things quickly by mail and that that's really why it's like, no, 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 no. The idea ideas are a dime a dozen. You know, they may be even cheaper than that now. And, and really it's, can you take that idea and make it into something of genuine value to people you know, that they can afford, that is interesting, that can give you a profit so that you can stay in business and, and having this this protectiveness about your ideas. I've had clients who have wanted to connect to other clients in our portfolio because they've got an idea 
that they want to you know take to another vertical for example and they go well i can't they have to sign an nda before i talk to them Mm -hmm. and i say hey you know what i love you and i love the product and i love what you're doing i am not about to call anybody and tell them so there's a guy with an idea but you need to sign an nda before you hear it i mean that's just just not it's just not going to happen you know And, and and it's and it's great that people feel that way about their ideas but to understand it's really execution is literally everything um and you know if you've had an idea, it has probably been had by four before, but somebody was not able to execute on it. So, um, yeah, being protective Completely about your agree. socks. Completely yeah. agree. Absolutely. Um, nothing new under the sun, right? Uh, yeah. I wish I could think of some new things. I wish I could. <laughs> well, and then, and, and, and then, and then the problem is you got a notebook full of new things that you've never had time to pursue. So that's the, that's the real, uh, that's the real yeah. that's the real challenge. So but I do like I when lo- I see companies that do things I thought about ten years ago and they're successful. I'm like, good for them. They took the leap, they did it, they oh, figured it yeah. out. Like like for instance, like this leisure wear uh suits, like you know, like um dress shirts that fit a lot more comfortable than what we're used to. The whole dry right. cleaning thing and yeah. wrinkle free and all that. I'm like, yeah. genius. Yeah. Making your clothes yeah. feel more like gym clothes. I mean, that whole craze. Yeah, absolutely. Eat- hundred percent. And even down to the services level, you know, there's a clothing shop in town that does, um, you know, custom made shirts and, and you go, Oh wow, I bet that's expensive. And it's like, well, they might be a little more expensive than off the rack, but these guys have just built a business model that says, all right, I'm going to make six shirts for this dude. And you choose your fabric and your whatever. And they come back and they're 20% more than a regular. It's like, I got to wear a shirt. I got to yeah. go sit on a plane and fly and da da da. And if I can reduce my time in a hotel room ironing that thing, I'll take it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. You know, yeah. is that worth is that worth thirty dollars a shirt to me? Oh heck yeah! You know, when you <laughs> really think no about doubt. it, it is. When you really look back, it is. Yeah. So I love I love that kind of innovation and how people kind of kind of mash those things up. Um, yeah, good stuff. So now, really, we save the biggest and most important question for last. Okay. For all the money, for the million dollars, if you could have a meal with any living public figure, who would that person be and what meal would you have? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have a problem with this one because there's a couple things I'd want to do right now. Um, <laughs> thankfully, in my life, I've been able to meet President Clinton many a couple times, President Obama a couple times, um, have, have met you know, some actors, Matthew McConaughey right. did a thing in my district once, uh, a movie. Oh, neat. Um, and so I don't know what my answer is. I, I'll ask, I, I need to think about it more, but I, I have this thing with golf right now. Okay. I think COVID really helped with that. Um, where I started playing golf, like what, five years ago, post politics. Cause you have no time when you're in government. Right. Um, and now I'm kind of addicted as to, it's kind of my, therapeutic outdoor traveling and going to neat places and playing. And I'm an average golfer. I've gotten a little bit better, but I'm taking my first swing analysis this week. I've never done that. I've had one lesson in my life. And so, um, essentially you, you name your, your pro golfer, like successful Jack Nicholas, Tiger Woods, Mm. uh, you know, whoever the best is in the game today, I would love to just like sit with them for a weekend and just like, well, one, we can eat Italian food. I love Italian food. I'm half Italian. There you uh, go. And I don't eat it enough, to be honest. I love it. Uh, it's just, I can't, you know, once you hit your 40s, you know, you can't, you can't be plowing <laughs> down lasagna all the time. But like to have like a, have like a weekend where you can just hit golf balls with them and like learn from them. I think that would be cool. Um, so I would say, you know, one of those, a handful of like really, really athletic golfers who are the best in the world. Uh, I would love to do that. And I, I just think, cause I'm, I think it's like in my nature, it's so hard. The sport is so right. hard that when you hit a good golf ball, it's like the most gratifying thing in the world. And I don't know right now, that's kind of a thing I want to do. And so I would say that. And then, um, I love to just also do that for a weekend. We don't have to have Italian. We could have, um, I don't know. Uh, well, I'm from Kansas City, so we could bring we could bring them out some barbecue. I was gonna say uh, barbecue, and uh, and uh, do uh, like an entrepreneur, like an investor, like a Warren Buffett, or like you know these CEOs oh, yeah. you've mentioned on the show. Like, 
I love to just pick their brain and figure out what's coming up next. Like what, sure. what should I be looking out for? What should I be investing in or kit or, or maybe it's someone that's starting a new company that you just happen to have dinner with. that says, Hey, I have this idea. Like I, I value that more than like, maybe like the celebrity or the, right. you know, the, the, the one person. So I have a lot of different dinners I want to have, Andy. I'm sorry. My answer is uh, all over the place, but I definitely want to become a very, a better golfer because I wish I would have done it as a child in high school and college and all that, but right. I didn't, I played other sports. Um, so I've kind of gotten into that. And now that the weather's turning, it's kind of that moment where you're like, okay, I can go outside and do this. And right. So anyway, right. those are my two. Um, but I don't know. I love learning from anyone. It doesn't have to be a celebrity or a, that one person. Yeah, I hear you. And the golf thing is so interesting, and you're so right. I, I used to play quite a bit, and uh, the the whole joke that uh, the guys I played with and I had was, uh, you know, when you go play 18, you only need three good shots. I need one good drive, one good chip, and one good putt. And I'm happy. I'll come back, right? <laughs> and if, and if I don't get one of those in each round, then I maybe need to work on some stuff. And talking to pro golfers is a and trivia trivia thing. So when I was a kid, uh, my dad was a submariner in the United States Navy, and when he retired, he ended up we ended up living in Atlanta for a little while. And my bedroom was Davis Love the Third's bedroom when his dad was the pro at the Atlantic Country Club. So we ended wow. up buying what had been his kid home, you know, and there was a putting green in the backyard and it was on like the 14th fairway or whatever. So it was an amazing experience to kind of have that for a couple of years and uh, definitely uh, not the norm. But pro golfers have, I don't think people understand what goes into being a professional golfer because not only are th- is, is that kind of tournament physical output so grueling right to make the cut to play on the weekend and be on television and then you have to do that week after week after week after week after week for years and preserve your body but you're also really an entrepreneur because the the money there is in having a brand and working within the pga strictures and then having sponsorships and all of that kind of stuff and occasionally you know you see somebody like a tiger woods who's just a phenom or a jack nicholas who's a phenom who just dominates the game or arnie palmer um but you know when you then look at maybe a vj singh who's not as camera friendly you know his story maybe isn't as compelling um or phil mickelson or any of those guys you know they really have to think about their career from a public relationship standpoint dare i say it from the start of getting out of q Q school right Mm -hmm. so that conversation to me is endlessly fascinating uh learning about the mental game of golf the physical you know how to hit the ball further farther faster Um, and i just like to talk to them about it i mean there's so many good young players i watch the tour every week um i've gotten into it man and I, i i just think like how great would it be if i was a i mean i'm a 12 handicap now if i ever got to like a five and then you know, that's all about, I want to get just so when you're out with your friends and your colleagues, you're like, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not popping them up off the tee or slicing right. them too much. Um, <laughs> I don't know that that's a goal. And I, I, I did go to a simulator the other day when it's been cold here in the Midwest. And the guy that it said to me, he said, you know, you've already, you've already, you're, you're a guy that's, that obviously is into it and that cares, which means right. you're going to be successful. You know, as long as you care and you have you put in the effort and the time, I think you're right. you'll be successful. You'll get better at whatever you do. Yeah. So yeah. that made me feel confident. Agreed. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. You you never you never want to be the player in a foursome where everybody's going. Where's Andy? Well, I think his ball's back there somewhere. Or yeah. <laughs> you know, and last again, I saw nobody him, really he was ca- <laughs> nobody really cares how good we are because we're amateurs right. and it doesn't matter. But like you right. know, for oh, yourself, yeah. you care. Oh, nobody sure. cares where sure. I hit my ball except me. Right. Right. And it's, I'm not going to lie, it's fun to put money on a hole every so often and feel like you might have a chance at winning it. You know, <laughs> that's, that's kind of a, you know, a little I'm pressure. Like, exactly. A little pressure to perform. You know, we all need it. Well, hey, I appreciate your time. We have been at an hour and um, as I said, hang out, but we'll wind it down here uh, again. People, this has been Jason Grill. He is the founder, head dude at J Grill Media. They do consulting in public affairs, communications, public policy, and media. Um, and again, uh, he's got the podcast, The Grill Nation, Grill Nation Show. And and I think you know, Jason, something that you know, we always 
uh, encourage people to do in their businesses is to look at all of these services around what they do that can help them grow. And I think a visit to jgrillmedia.com is worth the visit for anybody who's listening to this show because getting an idea of how do I communicate out in my com- out in my community, public policy, how do I get into the newspaper and all that kind of stuff is something worth um, thinking about for pretty much any business. I mean, that's that's a that's a given in my world. Obviously, we're more on the paid piece, but the kind of stuff you do, I think, is vitally important to people growing. So, again, encourage everybody listening to go check that out. Um, connect with Jason, connect with his podcast, and get some more great content. And, and, if, I guess, and I'd love to just say, I'd love to just say, if you want to connect with me, I have um, many many social media sites: Jgro Consulting, Jgro Media. But um, I'm on Linktree now. I never was on that. Oh, I saw that on Instagram all the time, but it's just it's just backslash Jason Grill, and I have like all my social properties. If you go to, uh, I think it's linktr.ee.com backslash Jason Grill. Awesome. Well, think, that sounds yeah. like a plan. I love it. So, and then we will look for. Uh, Right to Start coming up this year. I'm excited about that, which yeah. tells me we're look probably that up. Have- right to start dot yeah. org. Uh, check that out online, and then. You know, connect with me on LinkedIn. That's kind of where I like to connect with people. So just on LinkedIn, just search for Jason Grill and uh, I'll connect with you too. I haven't even connected with you, I don't think yet. So we'll connect on LinkedIn. I love it. Sounds good. And I think I, you know, I definitely, if you're open, we'll definitely love to have you back here as the year moves on because I really want to see how the right to start stuff goes. And yeah, I'd love to have the have founder on that. too with me yeah. or have bring the fa- can send the founder to you so he can talk about it. He's an entrepreneur from Silicon Valley and now is based in Kansas City, but um, it's just a just a really insightful guy. And so maybe we can set that up. Yeah, too. that's a show we'd love to do. And so with that, we will end this episode and stop taping. Jason, hang around a bit. We'll talk a little and uh, see you next week, everybody. Thanks for joining us. You can find contact information about our guest in the show notes for this episode. This has been the How I Make Money podcast by Brand Distillers. To learn more, visit branddistillers.com.